Center for Equality and Justice uh, is a women, all women organization, and we engage in rights based, based work. Initially, our work involved working with war affected women, but uh, we have now expanded our mandate and we work with youth. We also work with the LGBTIQ community, uh, but we also have expanded the reach of the sort of the organization by working with Sinhala, Tamil, and Muslim women that have been affected by the war, but also by different forms of political violence or civil disturbances. So we have included all of that. But I think the main uh, fact is that we work also at different levels. We work at local level, we work also work at national level and international level. So it's about taking or raising awareness among the communities about the different violations that occur in this country and you know the different communities and the women in those communities and what they're affected by and trying to t link those women in the communities to policymakers and lawmakers so that their views will be taken into consideration when different laws are being um, uh, are being uh, formulated or policies are being formulated. So really that is sort of the broad ambit of the work. Uh, but in terms of issues themselves, we look a lot at um, issues of uh, reparations for women who have been affected by violence, not only violence, by, by the war and by political, um, different types of political violence. Uh, but we also look at um, sexual and gender-based violence and how women uh, and other community and other genders have been affected by sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, but we also have we we work with youth and we try to sort of uh, work mainly with the university where we try to talk about um, preventing and countering violent extremism. So and and I think the broader sort of goal of CEJ is to uh, achieve gender justice but looking at reconciliation in this country as a primary goal for all of the work that we do. But our focus is on women. So sexual and gender-based violence or the term gender-based violence is usually used interchangeably. Uh, and usually what it means is that um, uh, it is an act of violence that is uh, targeted against individuals based on their gender. So this can include girls, boys, men, women, and other gender minorities as well. If you look at the different forms of sexual and gender-based violence, there are many. And in, even in Sri Lanka, we have all of these different forms of uh, sexual and gender-based violence. And it can be sexual, it can be physical, it can be emotional or psychological. So these are the different forms of SGBV or gender, sexual and gender-based violence uh, that that are uh, you know that are in the community. And if you look at the, if I want to give you examples of these different forms of SGBV, we can start with, for example, domestic violence or rape, uh, child marriages, female genital mutilation, sexual harassment in the workplace and in the public space, sexual exploitation. There are many many types, and I think one of the some of the major types I have mentioned, but also the issue that it's not only in the in the <clears throat> in the public domain, but it has also gone online now. So we have online or cyber violence also taking place, where girls, boys, women, and men are subjected to sexual violence on the internet. Uh, so these are the different types, and uh, I would also like to add that uh, the phenomenon of child marriage or forced marriages are also come, also come within the definition of sexual and gender-based violence. There are many, many challenges and I think, um, you know, this is some of the research that I've been doing for the last, I think about 25 years and, um, you know, what we find is nothing improves and that is my um, dilemma i mean i wonder because there are so many actors so many uh, organizations and activists working on this issue but very little has changed uh, and if you look at the challenges that women face when they access the criminal justice process there are many obstacles along the way so take the police station, for example, if a woman goes to the police station to um, uh, basically complain about uh, some form of violence, for example, it can be a rape, it can be domestic violence where her husband has beaten her up, 
right you would have a situation where i mean this is not across the board of course you will get the odd uh, odd uh, sort of um, aberration where there are police there are police that are actually sensitive to the case but what you get usually is that police uh, officers are insensitive to the issues that women face so they tend to trivialize what happens for example you might have a situation where a woman goes saying that her husband had beaten her up the police might say uh might laugh at it might also say please go back home and live in you know live together with your husband you don't want to break up a family which which, which has very dire consequences for the women because it can even end up in death so this is this is the kind of uh, thing that you get because i think the police also feels that um they need to keep the peace but i think the point being that they cannot be counselors they cannot be mediators and i think that is a not a role that the police is supposed to, it's not within their mandate so i think this is one hurdle in addition to that you have a lack of a space at the police station to complain i mean we have uh, what is called a women and children's desk that have been established at police stations island wide but actually when you go and visit them you realize that these women and children's desks are really more in name than in in, in structure really because you find that um there are male police officers at the desk supposed to be police women police constables that are supposed to be at the desk the point being that sometimes you might find that the women are as bad as the men so wh- what i'm talking about here is sensitivity to the issues and the fact that women need to have not sympathy but empathy at the police station and and a professional attitude towards the fact that there has been a violation of a right of a woman so that is one obstacle and i think one of the major obstacles also at the police station and right throughout the criminal justice process is the issue of language because when women go to the police station sometimes they and we have had many many reports of this that uh, women um face a language barrier what i mean by that is that there are police officers that do not speak the tamil language so you would have for example a tamil woman or a muslim tamil speaking woman going to the police station and being unable to communicate with the police officer and some might trivialize this issue but really it's not a trivial issue because this can have a uh, um a ripple effect throughout her case especially if it goes to court because the evidence that is taken down at a police station is extreme is is evidence for her case and if that is her statement is not taken down properly uh, that means that this will not be a piece of evidence that can be taken seriously or uh, you know in, in a manner that is uh, suitable in a court of law so this is a huge issue because uh, you would have uh, sometimes victims at the police station signing off on a statement that they don't know how to read so you have a police officer writing it down in singular and the tamil speaking victim actually signing off on a statement that has been written in singular and you can see the you know the inequality the discrimination that women uh, you know uh, that speak tamil in this country face when they go to a police station so that's at the police station but when you go i mean you know if you look at the court process process for example you would have judges the lawyers again trivializing the case there's also the fact that women have to relive the trauma that they have undergone for example if you have and we have had i mean i have done research where young girls um go to, go to a court of law and uh, their mothers have told us how these girls have been victimized in the court process for example lawyers cross examine them in a very um in a very unprofessional manner uh, it, it's always the the burden is on the victim to prove that uh, uh, this didn't this happened to her right it's not on the perpetrator so the, the the fact that the woman or the young girl is traumatized by the experience that she has in court it's not only the lawyer you have the judges also when they um, write their judgments also being extremely insensitive to the issues of violence against women or sexual and gender based violence it's also uh, the woman as a court user for example it is the other court staff you have the registrar you have the um, the interpreters you have the clerks all of them being extremely antagonistic or hostile and extremely unempathetic to the woman so this is in the courts uh, in the courts you also have the hospitals 
so for example if a woman goes to the hospital and says i have been raped right we have a lack of medical expertise we don't have enough judicial med- medical officers that will record a, a, a complaint or uh, investigate her medical condition as a result of the rape for many reasons one is expertise the other is the fact that they have no time they have no time to give a woman who has come there he he has many other patients in line at the opd waiting uh, to be served that time so you have a situation where a woman most of the time in, not not even in a private space being examined uh, for you know when, when she alleges rape right and then the medical um, officer writing the medical legal report which is really not um, accurate so, or, or sometimes too broad and this again cannot be used in a court of law i think the point being that there are all of these different uh, issues are interconnected and we need to make sure that um, uh, uh, that medical officers also know the crucial or critical role that they play within the criminal justice process and the fact that when they record um, a condition or a, a injury of a woman who has been subjected to violence that they need to do it properly because this can become crucial or critical evidence in a court of law so that is the medical part of it but i think overall we have structural injustices you have a situation i think where laws are not implemented properly so within the criminal justice process you have different laws that apply we have a penal code which which criminalizes rape sexual harassment and other forms of violence uh, which are not implemented properly many people are unaware of the fact that there is a law like this there are laws like this you also have laws that require amendment right in order for the criminal justice process to um to uh, basically function properly so what i'm trying to say here is that uh, i would like to call it a labyrinth or a labyrinth or a maze where women enter the criminal justice process and they have to somehow find their way out very it is a very hard process and they will finally get out but we don't know the trauma that she has endured while traveling through that maze and i think that is the issue that we're trying to address here I think in terms of the criminal justice process we have failed women uh, the criminal justice process i believe has failed women uh, in in terms of the implementation of the different processes that we need that have been uh, put down in the law and the fact that the actors within the criminal justice process do not take these issues seriously so as i said uh, the, the the fact that um, you have uh, the actors within the criminal justice process for example the lawyers the judges the police officers the medical health professionals uh, uh, displaying a complete lack of sensitivity to issues that women face so for me it is about providing that sensitivity we do not take seriously enough the fact that all of these different actors require attitudinal change and the fact that they need to be sensitized to the issues of violence against women and other women and other gender minorities as well it it is about um reforming the whole process um uh, which starts with sensitivity and i think there are many laws that require reform as well we need to bring in um amendments to the laws but we also need to bring in new laws to cover different forms of violence that mm-hmm. are emerging for example online harassment we sri lanka does not have uh, proper laws or sort of uh, express laws that cover online harassment that is one issue uh, even within the domestic violence act uh, we we have a fairly good domestic violence act but there are many uh, people that are not covered many perpetrators are that that are not covered for example ex cohabiting partners are not covered by the domestic violence act uh, so you know you, you you we need to sort of make sure that these uh, reforms come in come in uh, but also i think it requires policy makers to understand that these are serious issues these are some these are issues that need to be taken seriously by those that govern um it is about making sure that policies are implemented properly that laws are implemented properly and for that you need 
sensitization to take place at all levels and it means also making sure that for example police officers that they when they go through their trainings at the different police uh, training institutes that there are modules for example on what is sexual and gender based violence what are the issues and about attitudinal change the fact that women go through a uh, women and other gender minorities boys men go through these issues and they need to be sensitive to it these things need to be incorporated uh, as modules into their training programs uh, and also that there needs to be refresher programs at a frequent at frequent levels so that they remember and they continue to uh, streamline the fact that sensitivity is something that is at the core of their work um so whether they be lawyers i mean i know for a fact uh, that lawyers also do not go through this kind of training many of our law schools don't um uh, take uh, sexual and gender based violence seriously you might have students coming out as lawyers who don't even understand the basics of sexual and gender based violence so then i mean the question arises how do they practice in a court of law how do they you know how do they go and present themselves do they have empathy do they realize the uh the dire consequences or the very grave consequences that um victims survivors of sexual and gender based violence face as a result of um the violence that they have gone through uh and you know and and i i think the point being that um law schools need to teach these uh, need to teach bring in sort of issues of gender based violence in their teachings so that the lawyers of tomorrow the judges of tomorrow uh actually understand where they're coming from and the fact that you need to be sensitive to the issues that of sexual and gender based violence and why why what what are the costs of sexual and gender based violence so i think these are some of the things i'd like to sort of point out here there are many more uh but i i stop there there are many organizations uh, for example you have uh, uh, support service organizations uh, organizations like women in need uh, uh, that is one organization then you have another organization called sisters at law uh, but you also have an and legal action worldwide these are organizations that uh, provide counseling and legal support to victim survivors of sexual and gender based violence but you also have hotlines you have a national hotline uh, which is being run by the ministry of women's affairs uh, and the number that you, the hotline is 19381938 which can be used by a victim survivor of, of uh, sexual and gender based violence to report the offence right the other is uh, 119 the general line that we call for police complaints that is another women in need has also has a hotline that you can call so there are there are hotlines and organizations that provide this support but i think the point is that um communities in our country need to know that these services exist and that is where the gap lies because uh, very few people really don't know where to turn when something like this happens to them uh and, and i i also want to sort of really um emphasize the fact that during covid-19 during this pandemic uh there has been a rise in the numbers of domestic violence incidents uh, for obvious reasons you have women and men you know in very impoverished communities included that uh, are holed up in their homes with no way of getting out so you have a situation where uh women are battered by their husbands they have nowhere to go there's a lockdown and you can't get out right how do we how do we uh, reach out to them how do we make sure that they have some kind of support service i think we need to think about this very broadly to make sure that there are systems in place to address some of these issues right for example i think it's about reaching out to communities maybe you know going back to like the way this example um announced the fact that there is uh, vaccinations being rolled out with a, using a megaphone using a megaphone in the community you use a megaphone and walk, you know drive through community saying there are certain services available these are things that we need to be innovative we need to be innovative uh, based on the context that we're living in 
And right now we are going through a pandemic. It's not over yet. And I think it's really important that uh, certain, um, uh, you know, that are at the highest level, at the policy level, but also at the local level, that we continue to create awareness on the different support services that are available. It's not only the hotlines. I think it's also the fact that uh, there are counselling services available. There is legal support available in different organisations, which are spread out across the country. So you have, um, you know, for example, counselling, which is extremely critical for uh, victim survivors of gender-based violence. Uh, but also, I must flag the fact that counsellors need to be professionally trained counsellors. It's not should not be counsellors that have got training for three days. It should be counsellors who are professionally trained, have gone through a long training period of counselling, so that a victim survivor gets the correct or the uh, correct picture and gets counselling in a very professional manner so that they're able to deal with the situation at hand and take certain decisions. I think it's about that. The also, I'd like to also mention the fact that there are shelters. There are shelters or you know safe houses that are run by uh, both the government and by non-governmental organisations. Uh, there is one being run by the Salvation Army as well, uh, which provides a safe space for women and girls to come in and stay there till you know till the situation eases or uh, you know there are you know different reasons why you might you might go back to your home or to be relocated. Uh, there's also WDC, the Women's Development Centre based in Kandy, uh, that has a safe uh, shelf, uh, has a safe space uh, for women and young girls uh, who have been abused or you know have have, have uh, gone through teenage pregnancies, etc. Who can who, who provide uh, an immense service uh, to women and girls by providing things like vocational skills. They go through uh, different training programs. Uh, till they are able to face the community again, uh, even in terms of um, uh, education. Young children who have been abused uh, are, are sort of uh, trained or provided with schooling at these, uh, you know, at these, uh, at these um, uh, centers. So they're able to continue with the education. So there are different um, services available. At, but I, as I said, I think what I'd like to flag is the fact that we need to create more and more awareness among the communities about uh, these services that are available. I'd also like to just say that CEJ or Centre for Equality and Justice, currently the work that we're doing on this project is to raise that awareness among communities. Uh, so we are trying to sort of uh, do sort of uh, um, engaging, um, um, reaching to communities through innovative means. One, one planned um, uh, in, uh, initiative is to work with uh, puppeteers or puppets to reach uh, communities. For example, the singular story Mahadana Mutta has been modified and uh, we have a script now and we're trying to go out to communities. Uh, if the pandemic allows us, the pandemic allows us to reach communities uh, to create awareness about the different forms of sexual and gender-based violence, uh, and to talk with communities about the services that are available. But through this project, we are also trying to reach out to policymakers and lawmakers that these are, again, uh, issues that need to be taken to that level. And there has to be action at policy level to make sure that um, all of these, uh, you know, um, uh, the redress that women and girls need uh, in a situation of the pandemic, you need to be addressing at the highest levels. For example, as I said, policy reform, right? So for example, you might have a, a situation where uh, police officers, uh, you know, there will be circulars maybe issued to a police officer saying that uh, this uh, domestic violence and, and uh, responding to a domestic violence incident should be considered essential service, right? This is something that other countries have done, right? So I think these are the discussions that need to be taken at policy level so that we can address the the the, the actual needs and uh, needs of the women and girls in our communities.
it's a tough question i agree with you and i and i understand the perplexity the the the, the complications or the complexities that are there within that question right i, I mean in our work and in my work actually for many many years we have tried to address this question right i mean if you tell a woman go and complain against your husband right what does she do next in a situation where she is economically dependent on on the husband for you know for 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 the you know her 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 life for her food for her children what does she do that is why i said that there need to be support structures in place that are that work well i mean a woman is not going to complain against her husband like you said right it is also about the stigma she faces in the community and the fact that she will be labeled as a bad woman or a bad wife i think you know and she needs to live with that right it's for his economic dependence it's the fact that she needs to face the social stigma her children need to face the social stigma of not having a father right they can be ridiculed in school um you know there will be people her fr- their friends who will laugh at them saying your father has left or your father is a wife beater so what happens is the woman will stay in the home right because there are no support structures in place to assist her it's a major issue and i i mean i completely understand your question it's easy for us to say look go and complain right I, 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 as a rights based organization that is what cj would also um uh, you know uh, sort of uh, that is what our message would be but you know the realities need to be looked at and the fact that women need a support structure so you you know you might have so that is what we need to put in place i mean there are many organizations for example that will even a company uh, 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 you know a victim to the police station they might uh, even uh, they might even um, uh, have lawyers there are lawyers that would you know accompany a victim to the police station because of the, uh, the, the you know the dangers that she might face there uh, i i mean there are situations where sexual bribes have been asked by police officers i think the recent news also you know carry some of these things so i think you know uh, the, the point being that the the dangers of actually going to a police station will really deter her from approaching the criminal justice process in addition to that like you said there have been situation i remember a case where uh, uh, you know a girl and you no know, because of the delays in the criminal justice process for example if you report a case of rape when you are 5 years of age and even actual story uh, actual case uh, you report it at when you are 5 years of age right and by the time the just uh, the final judgment after appeals uh through the court process have gone up to the supreme court uh it took 22 years for that that little girl to get justice by that time she is around 20 you know around 30 years of age and she is married now her husband doesn't know that she went through a endure uh, you know uh, violence or uh, sexual assault at the age of 5 years how does she deal with that how does she deal with it so you know the very complex problems so what would you do you will not go right and uh, you will not go and uh, access the criminal justice process for whatever reason because you don't want that label on you you don't want others to know and the fact that in our cultures and i don't like that word culture in our in our societies we blame the woman right it's your fault it's your fault that you went uh, to the police station why did you go alone why did you go to complain you should have just kept quiet right that is why it happened to you right or that is why because you did not cook your cook your husband's dinner properly or you know it was not hot or and these are i'm mentioning real actual cases right um these are the reasons why there is abuse in the home there's also alcohol alcoholism you know that's one of the factors uh, and I, i i think you know women need to have some strength or resilience to be able to report a case but they will only do that if they know that their case is going to be tackled or dealt with properly or addressed properly and that they will get some kind of relief there is no point otherwise going through the criminal the, the the trauma of going through a criminal justice process is really not worth it right as a lawyer i myself would tell a woman look it's too much for you 
right? The stress is too much for you. I don't know. I mean, are you able to tackle it? Right? I sh- I should not be saying that, but that's the reality, right? You need. I mean, as a as a as I said, I'm a rights person, but I think it's important that woman is able to have confidence in the system to be able to go to uh, uh, you know through the criminal justice process um, with um, with pride, with some kind of pride, and knowing that she is reporting a case, uh, an offence that has been done to her. Right? She needs to have the strength and the ability to, um, and the and the resilience to go through that process. And I think that comes only with attitude on change, with about about empowering communities to tell them, look, this is your right. You have a place to go, but we can't tell that unless there really is a, there really is. There, there really are systems in place. We would be lying to them if not. So I, I think you know these are some of the things that we need to take into account when um, talking to communities and uh, empowering women to 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 be able to take on the criminal justice process, right? But at the same time, as I said, it's also bottom uh, top down as well, which is sensitizing lawyers, sensitizing judges sensitizing police officers, medical health professionals to be able to deal with a case and give that necessary, um, uh, to be fair, to be impartial, to not be biased against the woman when she comes in front of them. These are the things I would think that, you know, need to be done.